day and welcome to Street Commodore's Live Volume 11. Coming to you direct from Heathcote Park Raceway and the 2007 Holden Drag Nationals. A massive event and you're going to see all of it on this very DVD. Also coming up... Ace SS, one of the best utes we've ever featured, comes back one more time in its final, ultimate incarnation. We head to Heathcote in Victoria for the Holden Drag Nationals. So big, we split it into two parts. In our latest super cheap DIY, Liam shows you how to service your ride. We take a look at the very rapid Castle Hill Exhaust VT. We get a guided tour of the Crow Camps facility and discover how a cam is made. We head out onto the open road in the latest in Holden's range, the awesome VE Ute. Take a trip with us to southern New South Wales for the awesome South Coast Nationals. We get an inside look at Cyber Motorsports and a very special project that they're working on. And Aaron Noonan takes us inside Jack Daniels Racing. And this time we get to check out their amazing transporter. But coming up first, Ace SS. This segment proudly brought to you by Dino Dynamics. Originally purchased as Frank Perinace's work ute, its fourth and final rebuild now has this BYSS far from a tradies utility vehicle. So far in fact that it easily ranks as the most head turning SS ute we've ever featured, and here's why. first thought is how big are those wheels, well, you're not alone. People always come up next to me and just always ask what size are those wheels on the back, you know? I should put a tag on my head saying 24. They're not just any 24s. To make fitment easier, these intro billets were custom made to the perfect offset. A fair amount of extra rear guard tubbing and diff adjustments were required to make way, in addition to custom billet axles which keep the wheels snug against the body. These work in conjunction with the jumbo springs and shortened bore pedder shocks to lower the ride height by 4 inches. It became clear that a serious brake upgrade was needed to tame such massive rollers, so the engineers at Sam's Performance looked no further than a VTTR big brake caliper kit. Slotted rotors on all corners measure 360mm at the nose and 330mm on the rear, and it wasn't long before we saw why such massive brakes were necessary. That's the result of a 383 cubic inch Stroker LS1, which houses an Eagle 4 inch crank connected to Eagle rods and 10.8 to 1 diamond pistons. Without the 8 throttle body setup, they had 340 kilowatts at the back wheels. The pronounced trumpets is all you'll see of this engine because Frank has stored it away under this sleek all metal dress panel. You'll find these flames by MFX graphics also travelling through the perfectly neat tray panelling, complementing the stunning black finish. Although you can't see the LS1, it makes its presence built nonetheless. That beautiful sound is created by a dual three and a half inch stainless steel exhaust. Ace SS retains its original T56 six speed manual gearbox but that's about the only factory standard part remaining on the car. As you make your way through the scissor lift doors and into the race buckets, you're surrounded by a bright red leather trim.
an outbreak of suede spread across the steering wheel, parts of the door trim, and the roof lining, including the embossed SS logo. The stereo consists of a Pioneer head unit, splits in the doors, 4 inch rear speakers, 2 amps, and the sub in the fuel tank access panel. Shooting this VY in public proved to be a difficult task, with onlookers constantly interrupting. The public's always coming up to the car and just always admiring it. People love it, everyone compliments me on how it's come up. Well there's no doubt it looks the goods, but how does it drive? On the road it feels really good, and, you know, comfortable, and no problems whatsoever with it. My nephews always want to go in it, always want to take it for a drive. My son especially just loves going for cruises. Every Friday night I take him for a cruise. Him though it's around the local area, he just loves it, he adores it. After so many rebuilds to Ace SS, we wondered where its future lies. There's no more to do on this, it's come to an end. As the builder would say, I hit the nail on the head this time, fourth time around, final. I don't want to get divorced from my wife. <laughs> Stick around, because after the break, we'll give you a massive dose of drag racing action on part one of the Holden Drag Nationals. 60 cars, over 75,000 rear wheel kilowatts, one dyno. Dyno Dynamics, official supplier of the Summonats Horsepower Heroes for 14 years. Preferred dyno for major auto manufacturers. Dyno Dynamics is the choice for big horsepower runs. Dependable, repeatable, and unbeatable for simplicity. Don't trust your tuning to anyone less. Visit www.dyno.com.au for your nearest Dyno Dynamics dyno. This segment proudly brought to you by XHP Wheels. Who doesn't like a bit of drag racing? Personally, we love it, which is why we packed up and headed off down to Heathcote for the Holden Drag Nationals, held on the 20th of October. We arrived at the track on Saturday morning, where we were greeted by a sea of Commodores all keen to jump on the go pedal. The event was split up into brackets, 14 and over, mean street, 4.0 to 13.99, tough street, 10.0 to 11.99, super street, and 9.9 and under, pro street. On top of these brackets, racing was further divided into quickest VL and fastest female racer, with prizes also awarded to the best burnout and the fastest mile per hour in ET. The brackets were dial your own, which made for some very exciting racing to say the least. had to be tactical. It was no use going fast if you could only do it once. You had to be consistent, which was many people's undoing. Oh, 
basically just couldn't get it to sort of uh, run too good. Idling was all fine, then just up top, just, yeah, missing and wasn't its day, really. The meet was really the domain of the early girls, with BBs to VLs being the most strongly represented by a long shot. BBs to VK sporting big eights seemed to be the flavour of the month, with a number of cars opting for the typical Cam's Up 308 or Super Angry 355 Stroker running well all day. Clint's Harlequin VK drag car came out to play for the first time in quite a while and it's proved that it's still in superb form. The car runs a 750 horsepower NA383 cube stroker that was enough to propel the VK into the low nines. Power certainly isn't a problem for the thing as it stands, evidenced by a shaky start to the day, which, after possibly the most extravagant staging burnout, saw the car end up at the better part of 45 degrees to the wall. The 8s fared particularly well in the warm heat coat weather, not handicapped from heat soak like the VL turbos and other forced induction cars. Now, what have you brought along here, mate? Uh, Two-door LJ Tirana. Oh, what's it got in it? Um, a 202 Holden 6. Uh, any work done in the 6? or? Yeah, it's got uh, a lot of lot of headwork, solid cam, good pistons and all that kind of stuff, rollers, a lot of basic stuff that everyone puts in their engines, yeah. And uh, a power figure? Um, it's actually made 231 at the treads on the dyno. Yeah, pretty happy with that, out of a natural aspirated car. Definitely, mate. And uh, what have we run down the strip today? Um, best of 1299. Um, I'm trying to back it up with another pass and that'll sort of keep all the mates happy. Up next, Liam shows you how to service your ride, including oil, filters, lugs and leads. 
When it comes to mag wheels, you should be entitled to the latest designs, great quality, and above all, the best price. Well, look no further than XHP to make your Commodore stand out from the crowd. XHP have a huge range of wheels to suit just about anything you can drive. To see the full lineup, head to www.xhpwheels.com. And don't forget, when you roll on XHP, you're rolling on the best. This segment proudly brought to you by Super Cheap Auto. How good is this, guys? I'm excited, and you know why? Because I finally get a chance to work on my own car. We've dragged the veil into the Street Commodore's workshop for a long overdue service. Today we're doing oil, oil filter, plugs and leads. We're going to start by changing the plugs. Okay, so in order to get the new plugs in, we've obviously got to pull the old spark leads off. We're just going to pull them off, throw them on the floor, we don't need them anymore. We're not going to put the new leads on just yet. Put the new plugs in first and then we can worry about what leads go where. If you're not sure of the firing order before you pull the old leads off, don't disconnect them from the distributor. Make a note, number the leads, or consult a workshop manual and only disconnect them when you're positive you can put them back correctly. One of the key inconveniences about the factory intake manifold is the factory intake path, which actually blocks access to two of the plugs. All we're going to do, just loosen it all off, shift it around over here, and then we're home free. Obviously, alloy intercooler piping won't be applicable to every car, so there'll no doubt be some obstruction when removing your plugs. Headers will be a common complaint, but with an articulated socket attachment, you'll be able to remove the plugs hassle-free. Okay, so we've just pulled out the first plug and it's showing all the signs. The car is running extremely rich at the moment, which, which would account for the carbon buildup and the, the blackening of the tip. When you compare it to the brand new plugs, you can see the difference it's going to make. Good clean plugs help the car burn fuel more efficiently, making more power and ultimately running better. Foul plugs, as pictured, aren't good for much and, among other things, make the car run rich and hamper power output. Alright guys, this is where we're at. We our leads off, plugs are out. The last of the oil is hitting the drip tray at the moment and our oil filter is on the ground. All that's left to do now is start putting them back together. We're going to start by gapping our plugs. Altering the plug gaps impacts on the size of the spark between the electrodes. A larger spark burns more fuel but runs hotter. Gapping the plugs down allows the car to run a little richer, thus cooler, which is precisely what you want on a turbo car. For the VL, we ran with a 0.8mm gap, though for other engines, the standard 1mm gap will suffice. So with the new plugs in and gapped, we're not going to worry about the dodgy old spark leads, we're going to replace them with some 8mm spiral core leads. Over time, the lead internals break down and the resistance between the tips increases. To make the most of the spark from the distributor, you want as little resistance as possible, which is what fresh leads will offer. Okay, so if you're staring at something like this and scratching your head, don't fret too much. You'll find the numbering on the dizzy here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Correlates to the numbers printed on the dizzy cap. From here, it's a simple matter of installing the leads back onto the plugs and dizzy in the corresponding order. Take your time here, as getting the order wrong will render the engine inoperable. Reusing an old oil filter totally voids the whole process of changing the oil, hence the brand new one. The seal on the oil filter needs to be lubricated to effectively seal against the motor. Provided it's in good condition, a little bit of the old oil is great for this. When connecting the intake piping on any vehicle, ensure that the hose clamps are done up tightly and that there are no gaps between piping joints. Even a small vacuum leak will drastically affect the performance of the car. So it's a sump bulb back in, plugs are in, leads are on, filters on, all that's left to do is fill it with oil. 
For the Veil, we chose a Penrite HPR30 20W60 oil. This oil gave us ample viscosity at startup temperatures to lubricate the turbo, but was thick enough to compensate for the combination of an old engine and forced induction. Consult your workshop manual to find out what oil is best for your car. Alright, so that's it guys, I've just shown you how to service your own car. Just simple stuff like oil plugs and leads. You save yourself a lot of money in just over an hour's work, and your car's going to run noticeably better. Coming up, we get an up-close look at the 9-second twin-turbo VT from the Castleville Exhaust Workshop. What are you doing? Nothing. Where have you been? Nowhere. You've been to Super Cheap Auto again, haven't you? No, I haven't. No. How come you can't close the door? You can. No. With over 10,000 great value ideas for your car, garage and shed, you just can't get enough of Super Cheap Auto. Everything on all much, much more. Dale from Castle Exhaust. Uh, I'm the tuner here at Castle Hill Exhaust. Uh, and this is our VT race car. Castle Hill Exhaust in Sydney's northwest have been busy working on some of Sydney's toughest streetcars for 15 years now. And under the guidance of owner Dave Keyes, have become one of the biggest names in the Commodore tuning scene. They built some serious streetcars themselves before, but when it came to racing, their powerful engines were always undermined by the road-going car in which they were installed. Which is why Dave, along with CHE's tuner, Dale Hellier, decided to build a proper track car. I decided to build it because it had the uh, engine in the streetcar and it was getting a little bit out of control with the amount of power it was making. So, yeah, me and Dave sat down one night and decided to find a VT to put the engine and everything in. And, yeah, that's how it came along. In a one wrecked VT V6 executive, which was completely stripped and fitted out with a comprehensive Androspec roll cage, an HSV body kit comprising a GTO front bar, bonnet and side skirts, and a crop sport rear bar. The hardest thing we're putting together definitely to do on the whole cage. It's not something that we'd probably want to do again in a hurry, I would imagine. Uh, originally came from Bond roll bars, all bent up, and then we just had to cut it all down and, and yeah, weld it all together. It was then painted with a custom blue mix by DNK Auto Refinishing, and the quality of the finish is almost too good to race. So good, in fact, that it graced the cover of Street Commodore's issue 136. The most amazing thing is that it all came together in only six weeks from start to finish, which is incredible considering the result. Uh, the motor is just a basic 346 alloy block with uh, a set of scat rods, pro pistons, a set of heads from CD heads, uh, it's got a GDS camshaft and a set of ARP head studs. The engine is a wild LS1, which was originally at home between the strut towers of Dale's VYSSU. It features probe forged pistons and scat rods on a factory crank. The heads were modified by CD heads and on top sits an LS Super Spider Manifold from the USA. The real power is made by the custom twin turbo setup, which was built and installed by the CHE team. Two Garrett GT35R turbos sit on custom manifolds, feeding 15 psi boost into the LS1 through a front mount intercooler to make a massive 660 rear wheel horsepower. Backing up this brutish engine is a Transbrake equipped two speed power glide built by Craig's Automatics with a 5800 RPM dominator stall converter and feeding to the spooled rear differential. Suspension is pretty straightforward, with 9010 shocks in the front and Bilstein adjustable shocks in the rear. Springs all round are FE2 spec, which shows that you don't need masses of high dollar parts to get a late model Commodore to squat. Inside is race spec, with a single Kirky race seat sharing space with a B&M shifter, RPM steering wheel and sheet metal gauge binnacle. Sheet metal also features on the door trims, with the battery sitting where the passenger seat once was. Everything else is gone. When you're racing down the quarter, you don't want any extra weight slowing you down. In the boot is the color-coded fuel cell and brackets for a nitrous bottle. Yep, the boys are gonna put it on the gas when the time is right. Straight off the trailer, the car was quick at Western Sydney International Dragway, running a 9.65 at 144 mph straight out of the box, 
not hanging around by anyone's standards. That was detuned to 580 rear wheel horsepower, so with the extra power and a few other tweaks, the guys are expecting the car to run into the 9.3s with the current engine, before they step it up with a stroker engine and aim at the 8s. 9.6, 147. If there are odds on them reaching their goal, they'd be very short. The CHE boys don't take no for an answer. Keep your eyes on the magazine for updates on the car and its progress at the track, incoming issues. Ever wondered how your cam gets made? Stay tuned, because up next, Rob Henty from Crow Cams breaks the mystery. www.streetcommodores.com is your one-stop place for everything Commodore on the web. Sit down, log in, and hang on, because the Street Commodores website is full on. Where else can you read your favourite articles, watch the latest videos, download top quality images and hang out with over 30,000 like-minded Commodore fanatics. There's info about upcoming events, the latest news, regularly updated features and a forum chock-a-block full of info. You can also subscribe to the magazine or sign up to receive the Street Commodore's newsletter, which puts you in the running to win awesome prizes. The Street Commodore's website is constantly changing, so if you don't check it regularly, you'll miss out. For many guys, the cam is one of the most mysterious parts of their engine. We all know they're really important for performance, but how does one actually get produced? Well, we visited Crow Cams in Victoria to check out how they make one of their famous camshafts. Coming from humble beginnings as an engine reconditioning business, Crow Cams has become Australia's largest producer of camshafts for both OEMs and the aftermarket. Their manufacturing process is quite unique, so we had Rob Henty run us through it. Now Robert, it's a pretty involved process. What have we got here? Well, what a lot of people don't realise is that there are very few cam grinders in the world that can actually develop cam loads. Uh, we call this uh, catalogue cam development, where a cam company will take someone else's camshaft, take a master off that, and that magically becomes their own secret grind for that, that particular vehicle. So we're one of the few cam companies in the world that can actually develop our own grinds. And this unattractive looking machine here that we developed ourselves is actually a, a load generator. So it's a very high accuracy um, profile grinding machine where we take a round piece of metal on a mandrel like you see here. This one's actually been ground. It's one we've prepared earlier. But it's actually an exhaust lobe off a Ford overhead cam six cylinder. Now, what that is, is uh, as I say, it starts with a round piece of metal and then in very small increments on a very, very small cut, it creates that lobe one step at a time. It takes several hours but comes up with a very smooth, very accurate cam lobe. All right, well, we're over where the action is now. We've seen how a lobe is generated now, mate. What do we move on from there? We go to the master. Mm. What's going on? Okay, well from that master lobe you saw us earlier on the grinding machine, we then generate a cam master, which is this here. Comes from a piece of cast iron that we then use that master lobe. You're actually using a cam grinder in reverse effectively to generate this master. You're grinding this master on the machine. From that then you can actually generate as many cams as you like from that master, okay? So you'll see the machine in the background is rocking gently back and forth. That is actually following this master which is attached to this end of the machine here, okay? So that accurately follows the profile of the camshaft, right? So you've got a grinding wheel following the lobe on the cam which is faithfully following this master, okay? So that's how the process works from that master lobe. Okay, so we go to the, uh, the cam master, you load that into the machine. Now you're grinding a cam but how does it actually start before it starts? you start grinding the cam? Well, we, when you start with a camshaft, you've got to start with a camshaft billet. So we start with cam billets that we, we source from several suppliers in America, and they're what we call UGLs, unground load billets, which means that we buy them in this form here. This, this camshaft has the journals ground, it has the gears cut, it has the pins inserted, but as you can see, the lobes are black, they're as cast, which gives us the flexibility to grind a number of different profiles onto that particular camshaft. Alright, so you load the billet into the machine, you load the master into the machine. 
What's the actual process that goes through after that? Okay, well this actually started life as what we'd call a Burko cam grinding machine, but doesn't bear a lot of resemblance to that anymore because we've converted this machine from manual operation to CNC control here at ProCam. So instead of having an operator standing in front of this machine, turning the wheels, doing all the manual operations of dressing the grinding wheel, changing the master, it's all done automatically. So the operator can then concentrate on prepping the cams properly, doing the inspection properly, making sure everything else is right because the grinding process is controlled by computer so it's very, very consistent. Okay, so the cam comes out of the grinding machine. What's the next step after that? Okay, well it actually goes to another unique machine that we've built here at Pro Cams, which is a robotic checking machine where we actually inspect every single cam 100% for a number of different parameters, okay? They're loaded into this machine here. Once they're loaded, we check enter. A robotic probe then checks the cam journals for ovality. Then it'll check every single lobe for taper and also for position relative to the, to the timing mark. And it'll also check it for base circle run out as well. So the things that you'd normally check manually after you've ground a cam and maybe only one in 10, we inspect every lobe on every cam shaft here at Crow Cams in this robotic checking machine. All right, so after the checking process, uh, you know, depending on whether you've got a flat tappet or a roller, there's a couple of different processes that they go through after that. What have we got here? Well, what we're looking at here is the process that we finish off the flat tappet cams with. Once they're checked and found to be 100% okay, they go to the granitizing process that you see here. The cams are loaded into this mandrel and then they run through automatically through a series of chemical baths, which deposit a phosphate coating onto the lobes, which you see here. So they go in in the unground, in the ground sort of nate, uh, shiny finish, they come out with a black finish on them which is there for a rust preventative and also to give the cam a little bit of help in the breaking in procedure in that initial startup. So if the lubrication is not exactly perfect, it won't scuff up the cam as much. All right, so that's the process for the flat tappet cams. What do you actually do with the roller cams? Well, once they're inspected in the same machine for the parameters that we spoke about before, we actually put a lap finish on the loads, which a lot of companies don't do. They actually leave it as a ground finish, but. One of the um, procedures that we do for the car companies, for the rollers we grind for the performance cars out there, is we actually put a crosshatch finish on the lobes, a bit like a honing process for the bore of a block. And what that does is it actually gives a, a slightly rougher finish to the lobe, which gives the actual roller traction. So it'll actually roll rather than skid across the lobe, so it actually improves the longevity of the, um, of the roller cam setup. So that actually, by putting a rougher finish on the lobe, you're actually reducing friction. Yeah, you are. It's not a really rough finish, but just by taking out the very smooth, sort of linear pattern and putting a crosshatch on it, it just gives the roller a little bit more traction so it'll roll properly over the long term. Okay, so the cams are all finished. What's the final step in the process? Okay, they come into the packaging area here, put into a box with instructions, with a cam card, with a sticker and then they're put onto the great wall of camshafts you see behind us, as we like to call it. Yeah. I mean, we, we pride ourselves on our fill rate of our popular camshafts, so everything that's in our catalogue, we fill normally 98% every day off the shelf. So we keep hundreds and hundreds of camshafts, as you see behind me, on the shelf, and then our custom grind service on top of that. We can usually turn a custom grind roller or flat tap cam around in three to four working days and to any specifications that the customer requires. So pretty much any cam that a guy off the street would order out of the catalogue, you've got it on the shelf and you'll have it inside two days? Oh, absolutely. We can deliver a cam pretty much anywhere in Australia overnight for around $22 and having the stock on the shelf makes that service possible so people can expect to have a maximum two day delay in getting a cam anywhere, even to the most remote areas of Australia. Well guys, there's another Crow cam ready to go out to a customer. Yeah Rob, thank you very much for showing us through the process today. I'm actually amazed at how much goes into making a cam. No problem, my pleasure. Thank you, mate. Okay. Next up, we take two of Holden's new VA Utes for a drive on some sweet country roads. Perfect territory for the latest hay hauler. Rodney? Where's your father, sweetheart? He's at the shops. <laughs> Check this out. With over 10,000 great value ideas for your car, garage and shed, you just can't get enough of super cheap auto. In mid-2007, Holden unveiled their latest ute, the VE. 
It is a completely new design, the first since the VU was introduced in 2000, with some of the most revolutionary features ever seen in a utility vehicle. We were more than impressed at the launch, but we couldn't wait to get our hands on one for a drive. We got lucky and had two at the same time. Australia has a grand tradition of utility vehicles and Holden has just released what they're calling the ultimate incarnation of the U, the VE. Now right here we've got an SSV and behind me we've got an SS that we're about to test. But before we do that, here's a little bit of Holden Ute history for you. The Holden Ute timeline begins 60 years ago with the FX and travels through the subsequent decades traversing almost all Holden models, having been available with every engine, and transmission Holden has ever offered. The majority of Holden Utes created are now considered classics, especially highlights in the range like the FJ, EK, EH, HR, HK, HQ and WB. We then entered the Commodore era with the VG of 1990 through VR, VS, VU, VY and VZ. It's from here that we hit the VE. Holden have very strongly displayed the history of the Ute in their latest ad campaign. In a Transformers moment, the VU becomes the VE and then heads out of town. The perfect scenario for the Ute. So we decided to follow Holden's lead and hit some country roads to try the Ute in its element. Well here I am in a Morpheus VE SS Ute. Now this thing is a nice car to drive. It's got a six speed manual box behind the 270 kilowatt six litre V8. It's got the leather trim option. And I tell you what, it's a bit of a tradies wet dream. But as a workhorse, it's probably a little bit compromised. You see, the payload is only a little bit over half a tonne, which when you're carrying a lot of tools and equipment every day, really isn't very much doesn't give you much leeway, but as a performance car, it's a brilliant thing to drive. The performance and the handling is brilliant. It really gets up and goes, and it steers beautifully. The handling's so good, in fact, that I reckon if you didn't look in the rear vision mirror, you wouldn't know you're in a Ute. This thing is just like driving a VESS sedan. It's that good. In fact, it's probably even better. The performance in the 6-litre V8 is awesome. It's really torquey, and they've really fixed that problem with the LS1. Low-down torque, plenty of it. It's really, really good. Combined with the six-speed manual box, and you got yourself a real sports car. Right, so this is the SS. I wonder what the SSV is going to be like. So the SSV is what Holden is spouting as the ultimate ute. But what does it actually get that differentiates it from the Garden Variety SS, where you've got 19-inch wheels, leather trim. This one's got pretty cool trim, it's red. It's got the sports pods, as Holden calls them on the dash. But really, that's about it. There isn't that much. This one's got a six-speed auto gearbox, which is optional, obviously. And it still does a great job behind the six-liter V8. Maybe not quite as much fun as the manual box, but you can still have a play with this. You click the shifter across, it goes into sport mode, makes the shifts a little bit more aggressive, it'll hold gears longer, and if you're punting it through some twisties going down the hill, it'll change back gears for you as though you're driving a manual car, which is pretty cool. Now the SSV drives every bit as good as the SS. You just get that little bit more luxury in the SSV. And I suppose it's probably aimed at a slightly more mature buyer, it's perhaps looking for something a little bit sportier than a Calais, but they want that leather trim inside, they want those big wheels, 
on the U, you don't get the different tail lights like you do in the sedan. That's one thing that the U missed out on, which is a shame. Handling wise, these cars, they're stiff, but they still soak up the bumps really, really well. And on these twisty, bumpy roads we're on right now, they're proving themselves to be more than capable. The dynamic stability control, which was introduced in VE sedan, has been carried across into the U, and it's pretty much a lifesaver. It virtually makes these cars idiot proof. I'm no electronics whiz, so I don't have a clue how it does it. I just know that it works, and it works well. Holden have really excelled themselves with the design of the VE Ute. They've taken many of the issues associated with the VY and addressed them with the new model. The biggest change is to the interior, with the distinct lack of space in the VU fixed, or more appropriately, fixed threefold. The VY had 90 litres of interior space, with very few places to store loose items. The new VE has a monstrous 245 litres of usable interior space, with a huge amount of room behind the seats, including a pair of deep pockets, which can hold anything from map books to laptop computers. So, is the VE the ultimate ute, as Holden claims? Well, yes it is. It's the best utility vehicle ever built by Holden. In fact, it's the best ute ever built in Australia. I love both of these utes. I think they're fantastic. And if you're put off by the lack of payload capacity, I just think you might be missing the point. The SS and SSV are weekend warriors, designed as a coupe with a big boot. If you want to carry equipment all day, get an Amiga. If you want a super practical car that can carve up twisty mountain passes on the weekend, get an SS. If it's the best utility on the market you're after full stop, go and buy a VE Ute. You won't be disappointed. After the break, we head for a great country show, the South Coast Nationals in Maruya, New South Wales. 60 cars, over 75,000 rear wheel kilowatts, one dyno. Dyno Dynamics, official supplier of the Summonats Horsepower Heroes for 14 years. Preferred dyno for major auto manufacturers. Dyno Dynamics is the choice for big horsepower runs. Dependable, repeatable and unbeatable for simplicity. Don't trust your tuning to anyone less. Visit www.dynodynamics.com.au for your nearest Dyno Dynamics dyno. In late August, we headed down to Maruya's Surf Air Speedway, just two hours from Sydney for the 2007 South Coast Nationals. For those of you that have never been, the weekend is made up of a street cruise, show and shine, driving events, and of course, burnouts. The show played host to a surprising amount of our ex-featured cars, including Carl Simmons' black VP Ute from the cover of issue 130, Sean Sanders' awesome VK from issue 97, Craig Campbell's blown VK found in issue 126 and a plethora of other jaw-dropping vehicles. Maruya's main streets saw proceedings kick off with a cruise through the otherwise quiet town. With the route taking us to the speedway, this was a chance to get all the cool Commodores out cruising the streets before the real action begins. The Show and Shine competition was hotly contested, with cars like Chev 377 and Carl's Black Ute proudly on display. Carl's Ute took home four trophies, including Top Ute Pickup and Top 5 Street. Sean's VK scored him a place in the Top 10, as well as Top Street Machine overall. Finally, it was your chance to get out there and show what your Commodore can do. The U-Turn Go to Woe event has a simple concept. Drive down to the witch's hat, go around it, and stop back on the white line. Some got the hang of it, others didn't, instead opting to use it as burnout practice. Even Stoney got out there in Project Hauler and gave it hell.
pressure on, a few Commodores set the benchmark, including Phil in his gas wagon, who finished second, and also this awesome candy blue VC Commodore placing in the top 10. top it all off, Craig Campbell took his blown VK out for the third weekend in a row and gave it all it had with the blue tyres on the back. Check this out. a bright and sunny Sunday in Maruya, but you could be forgiven for thinking otherwise as Commodores engulfed the place and themselves in freshly churned out tyre smoke, putting it all on the line for pride and trophies. South Coast Nationals may only be a small show, but we've proven that it's definitely packed full of action. And with all these impressive Commodores, how could anyone not love it? If you want more info so that you can make the journey next year, check out the Street Commodores events page for all your event updates. If you'd like to see a feature car in the build, keep watching, because Cyber Motorsports has a surprise in store. Simply purchase a 10 issue subscription or subscription extension to Street Commodores for $99.50 and you'll also receive a free 5 issue subscription to Extreme Holdens worth $39.75. To take up this great offer or to check out other awesome subscription offers including huge discounts and free gifts, just go to www.streetcommodores.com. Danny Hoang started Cyber Motorsports in 1996 when he made moulds of the kit on his CRX and began to market them. He has won countless awards with his skills in sculpture and a love of cars, leading him into creating custom aesthetic parts and Cyber was born. Danny's outlook is simple. Some people display their artwork in a gallery, but he displays his on four wheels. Whilst ordinarily in this segment we would interview the subject, Danny is a little bit shy, so we've decided to let his work speak for itself. Okay guys, I know what you're thinking, but you are still watching Street Commodores live, so don't worry too much. Now I'm here today at Cyber Motorsports to check out the amazing work that owner Danny Hawang does here. It's really awesome stuff, so let's have a look. Every part of the body kit on the RX-7 is custom. From the front bar, to the side skirts and wheel arch flares, the louvered bonnet, and the rear bar and diffuser, all handmade by Danny. He's a painter too. The Harlequin was sprayed in-house. The car is a one-off. The multi-award winner is the only one of its kind. Okay, so that's the outside of the car. Let's have a look at the inside. On the inside, Danny let most of the factory pieces speak for themselves, but he did add a few choice handmade additions just to make it that little bit more special. Danny made the custom handbrake cover, seat rail covers, and the gauge pods on the dash filled with trick deffy gauges. The cargo bay holds some stereo gear and all of it has copped Danny's custom touch. Now the RX-7 is one of Danny's most famous projects and has had a lot of exposure in the media and on the show scene. But one project he's working on at the moment that is a lot closer to home for us at Street Commodores is going to be very, very special. Now I'll stop teasing you and we'll get the thing over here. Well have a look at this thing. What a weapon. Now it's obviously a V2 Monaro and it's owned by this guy, Mark Hunt, who's an Oceania super fighter. Now you know you're pretty damn cool when you've got your own action figure. Now let's put Mark just up here. 
Now Danny's done about 600 hours of work on this car to get it to this point. This is called the pattern state. It's the initial construction phase. Now it looks a little rough. That's because it's not finished yet. When these parts are completed, they'll be painted, then moulded, and fibreglass guards and parts will be made from those moulds. And that's what will be bolted to the finished car. Now let's take you around it and check out how it came together. At the front of the car, Danny sliced the original guard directly along the body line and then discarded the bottom half of the guard, replacing it with a pumped fiberglass section, which you can see here. Now obviously made out of glass and then it's finished with Nikki. It's gonna end up a little bit like this, finished fiberglass guard, which is a direct bolt-on replacement for the factory item. Now the rear section was a lot more involved because Danny had to make a mold of the entire rear three quarter from the door back, which then resulted in this fiberglass panel which has become the basis for the new wide body guard. He then built up the shape he needed using foam and body filler, which was then roughed back and smoothed to create the final shape. And this thing is seriously fat. You're gonna be able to fit a 12 inch wide wheel underneath, which is massive. Now, as with the front, this will get high filled and painted, and then will become a fiberglass guard that will completely cover the original. And he even has made a wing for the back which completely and seamlessly flows into the guard. This guy is talented. I'll bet this car has all you Monaro owners out there absolutely salivating. And I'll tell you what, it's got me thinking about buying one. Now this is gonna be a very special car when it's completed, so be sure to stay tuned to Street Commodores for future updates. I also have to say thank you to Danny for opening Cyber's doors for us today. He might be shy, but his work does all the talking for him. Up next on Street Commodores Live, Aaron Noonan takes you inside the Jack Daniels Racing Transporter. When it comes to mag wheels, you should be entitled to the latest designs, great quality and above all, the best price. Well, look no further than XHP to make your Commodore stand out from the crowd. XHP have a huge range of wheels to suit just about anything you can drive. To see the full lineup, head to www.xhpwheels.com. And don't forget, when you roll on XHP, you're rolling on the best. Hauling a V8 supercar team across Australia is a big deal. And in the latest of our segments here in Street Commodores, we're going to investigate the massive race transporters used to keep the nation's number one motorsport category rolling. Used for 12 of the 14 championship rounds held in Australia, but left at home for the international flyaway events in New Zealand and Bahrain, the Jack Daniels Racing Transporter is a home away from home for Larry Perkins' V8 supercar team. It not only carries the team's two racing Commodores, but it also carries enough spares to keep the cars running when they're away from their Melbourne home base. Now to get the V8 supercar to the track, you need a super truck, Jack Perkins, and this is exactly what you've got here where just about anything and everything, you can basically rebuild, rebuild a car. There's not a great deal you haven't got in here. Yeah, exactly right. You know, the, this is what they call the most important driver. He's the guy that can drive all the gear there. And you know, it's a 50 metre long truck and he has nerves of steel. But yeah, everything we need in here to rebuild a car from the ground up. And in this A trailer, we have our spare panels and we cart all our wheels and a couple of spare engines going here. And in the back trailer, we have all our nuts and bolts, special spares, and it's just a, it's a big piece of piece of kit. It almost is like there's a competition on the track with the race cars, but then there's a competition in the paddock as well with who's got the biggest rig. Yeah, absolutely, and the truckies, uh, they, they get into it a bit. They love polishing the fuel tanks and <laughs> have a bit of a competition in pit lane, but uh, no, our truck's a good, good looking truck and uh, you know, it's served us well over the years. Um, so in this A trailer, yeah, we have three spare bonnets for the two cars. We have uh, four or five windscreens. We also carry two engines in the front trailer as well as two engines in the back trailer. So we carry a total of four engines for the race cars over the weekend. We also carry our doors in here. We have a full car set of doors plus a spare driver's door as that's obviously the most crucial one. <laughs> we can always, you know, weld the passenger one shut. We need to be able to get in and out of the car. Uh, we also have all our other bodywork, our rear and front bumpers going here and also the spare tyre for the truck, which is pretty crucial as well. And uh, just some other little bits and pieces. As you said, the fridge for the catering, uh, the shock dyno goes in there and the fuel drums and whatnot. Let's go and have a look now at the uh the B trailer and to see what's in there and uh, how it generally a race weekend runs. We're in the workshop at the moment, but things obviously are quite different when we're in a race weekend, so we'll check out the B trailer. Let's go. 
there's so much stuff in here that, uh, that the fans don't generally get to see. And you guys, this is your base essentially for a race weekend, but you've got lockers here and there and everywhere. You've got drawers of bits and pieces everywhere. Yeah. It's half an effort just knowing what's here. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you know, all the guys know what's in here, but uh, obviously there's a fair bit of stuff here. We've got every nut and bolt that you may need to put on a V8 supercar and some more if you need to make a new little bracket or something. But uh, yeah, as I said, the two cars fit up the top. This trailer can actually carry three, one down the bottom here, but uh, we have all our toolboxes and pit equipment go there uh, come a race weekend and, and the two cars do go up the top. And other than that, all our drawers and all our spares fit in all these lockers and whatnot around the corner. And trust the old workbench here just in case. While it may essentially be a transporter, the race truck is also a refuge for drivers Jack Perkins and Shane Price. This is where they get ready to race and put their heads into gear before heading onto the track. Now there's a couple of big, big Bertha boxes down here and they're not just for show. No, that's a couple of spare engines. Um, we, as I said, we carry four, um, two in the front trailer and two in the back trailer. And these are in case of a, a bit of a failure, obviously um, we don't want that and thankfully this year we actually haven't had any engine changes thanks to the trusty guys in the engine shop. But um, you know at Bathurst it's a mandatory change, you put your race engine in during the week so uh, don't put too many Ks in the racing. And when we talk about putting Ks on engines they have lifespans before they need rebuild. How far will they generally carry you before they come back to the workshop and get a rebuild? Yeah we life them to 2000 Ks. Um, so generally a race meeting is about 500 kilometres, so you get about four races out of an engine before you start to noise and get a bit nervous or whatever, but then when you do a test day we typically take the, the engines with the higher kilometres for a test day, because if they blow on a test day it's not as bad as uh, on a race weekend when there's a bit of pressure on, but on a test day if it sort of blows up it's the end of your day, not so much end of your race weekend. There's all sorts of stuff here, whether it's electrical parts, engine parts, bolts, fasteners, nuts, washers, you yeah. name it, it's in here, and if we can have a yeah, we'll quick flick crack through, one of them open. crack one and see just what we've sort of got here. All clearly marked, all clearly labelled. I like that you've used my initials here, this is really <laughs> nice. Yeah, well these are AN aircraft spec bolts, you know, we use nothing but the best specification when it comes to the suspension, and the reality is you've got a driver's life at stake, so you've got to use the best equipment. And, and basically, again, that's every nut and bolt in the suspension, we use highest quality aircraft bolts. And uh, now as, as we move through the drawers, we sort of, yeah, as you said, we've come across uh, our electrical drawer here, full of spare switches and, and wires and potentiometers and stuff that you may or may not need on a, any given race weekend. But um, you've just got to be prepared. Now, it's not just race suits in here, Jack. There's uh, a few other bits and pieces. Yeah, there's race suits and shirts for when you need to jump out of the car. You've got very responsive commitments over the course of a race weekend. But this cool device, this is funky. It's not built for show. It's, uh, this is an important little vest that you run underneath the race suit, which is generally known as a cool suit. But yeah. Just talk us through, you've got a maze of... Uh... Basically, uh, when, when we're allowed to wear them, obviously uh, all this equipment is a, is a cool suit for the hotter races, especially Darwin and Indy in, in Adelaide. Uh, it's, a, it's a lot of weight because the guys have to run an ice esky in the, in the car and they also have to run a lot of water through the system. So we only get to run, run it when it's above 30 degrees. But basically, as you can see, it's a, a maze of uh, pipes running through a vest that we run under our race suit, which pumps freezing cold water through to keep us uh, you know, cool in the car. And when it's 60 degrees inside the car at Darwin especially, it's uh, quite a relief to, to keep yourself cool. With two young drivers, there's bound to be some funny business go on during a season. And with Perkins and Price, that's no different. Always wonders me. Obviously, there's two drivers in the race team. Shane Price has taken us through the cars, the street Commodores, but this is his, I guess, locker. I guess here. <laughs> I'm a bit concerned about some of the markings here. We've got Marcus, obviously Marcus Marshall driving the endurance yep. races for your team. The Stig. <laughs> I didn't know he had a gig here. Uh, Rocky Balboa just keeps on coming back and doesn't go away. And Kane is Kane's got the Kiwi, who's driving for your team in the races now. Fill me in, Perkins. What's going yeah. on here? Why are you the stig? Well, it's a bit of an internal joke. Um, Shane and I, we did start with Jack and Shane on our pigeon, pigeon holes, but uh, once we discovered Top Gear, the show, and <laughs> Shane seemed to think, I think I'm a bit of a stig, you know, rate myself a little bit probably, and <laughs> seemed to think I'm a pretty good driver. So he come in one morning, my pigeon hole's now the stig, and uh, Shane had a bit of a a uh, bit of a situation where he thought he was Rocky there at one stage, so uh, we thought we'd um, put a bit of Rocky on there and just have a bit of a laugh, but um, nothing too serious. It's nice to know there's a sense of humour lurking behind all the seriousness. Yeah, well you've got to have a bit of fun, I suppose. We go racing because we enjoy it and it is quite serious out there on the track, but it's stuff like this you can get away from it and uh, just enjoy what you're doing. So that's a quick trip inside the inner sanctum of a V8 supercar race team. The transporter is one of the team's most critical pieces of equipment and it serves many purposes. 
but the simple fact remains, without it, a team can go nowhere. More drag racing mayhem coming up with part two of the 2007 Holden Drag Nationals. By signing up to the Street Commodore's newsletter, you'll be ahead of the pack when it comes to the latest news, event info, what's on the forums, and a sneak preview of what's in the next issue. It's easy to sign up. Just head to www.streetcommodores.com and follow the links to the newsletter page. There you can tell us a little more about yourself, and when you hit the submit button, you've instantly put yourself into the running to win great prizes each and every month. Go on, what are you waiting for? VL bracket was hotly contested, with a few very nice cars turning out to race. Jet 3 Liter had been in the build for a few weeks before the event and received a new bottom end and a quick retune. It's a fresh engine, just went in uh, last week, sort of getting tuned up. New Link G3 computer, 3540 turbo, all standard inlet manifolds, 25 pound of boost, and uh, 386 on the dyno. The mile per hour didn't quite reflect this, though we did manage an 11.2 second pass. Nonetheless impressive considering the manual box off the back of the motor. Luke Jones took the VL Turbo class in his maroon U2 slow. The car was lightning quick all day and in an effort to take the final loop through caution to the wind and wound the boost up sky high. Few late model cars proved that bracket racing wasn't just the domain of the early girl. Tim Holmyard bought his super tough VXSS out. The VX runs a Nathan Higgins enhanced 427 cubic inch LS2 and has been clocking mid nines for quite some time, which was impressive in itself. But Tim stepped it up and brought it out to the Dragnats with a sexy new intake manifold that's apparently netting him a bucket load more grunt. Nine one at 160 mile an hour. You're gonna need big power in the top end to put that out. What kind of power is the thing putting out now? Putting out 600 kilowatt at the wheels. On how much gas? 300. The wheels up launches and bolt grunt took its toll on the drive line though. Uh, 
broke an axle in a diff and an axle in the stub axle in the wheel, in the hub. So I broke both. <laughs> of the same ilk was the VX Commodore of Martin Donnan's offsider, Garrett. His VX runs a Gen TT enhanced LS series motor and hovered around the high nines. Basically, it's just got a piston and rod engine built by Remax. Um, off the shelf TTR turbo kit from LS1 Turbo, MV Automatics Auto, it's running methanol, got a big fuel system for it, 160 pound injectors, makes about 480 kilowatts of the wheels to do what it does. No worries, and what's the quickest that we've seen it down the quarter today? So far, 1015 at 144. The potential of the twin turbo LS1 really knows no limits at the moment, and with the owners searching for more horsepower, the cars are only going to get quicker. Without a doubt the most chronically overpowered, over-engineered and above all else loudest vehicle in attendance would have to have been the Kappa sponsored Drag Monaro driven by Big Sean Kirkham. The Vortec V7 Charge 408 Cube LSX delivers 1400 horsepower and while power is in abundance it's getting that power to the ground and more appropriately keeping the Monaro straight that Sean's next major dilemma. Of the few runs Sean got in at the Dragnats, many resembled a lap of Eastern Creek with the Drift Australia crew. The Monaro is more than capable of eights and walked away from the event with the best ET and best mile per hour. Properly set up, it'll be one to watch. With the last tyre fried and the last pass illuminated on the time boards, it was time for the trophies to recognise those that performed at the top of their field. Like us, no doubt the event has only whet your appetite, so be sure to catch the next Holden Drag Nationals in 2008. Well, the Street Commodores Holden Drag Nationals have come to a close, which means it's time for this DVD to finish up too, unfortunately. Don't forget to pick up a copy of Street Commodores issue 137 when it goes on sale February 22. Until next time, guys, stay safe and keep your racing to the track.